Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara, Jamie, Lily, and Chloe. And always want to remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And we are going to get back into George Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. And we're going to summarize Chapter 2, then we're going to get into Chapter 3. And without further ado, let's get there. Okay, we are now going to analyze and summarize chapter 2. Summary. The next morning, George and Lenny arrive at the ranch and go to the bunkhouse. The old swamper, Candy, informs them the boss is mad because they were supposed to arrive the night before. After Candy shows them which bunks to take, the conversation turns to people at the ranch whom he describes. When the boss arrives and questions Lenny and George about their work history and skills, George answers for Lenny, causing the boss to question Lenny's silence. George emphasizes Lenny's power and work ethic. Suspicious of their partnership, the boss asks George why they left their last job. George explains that the work was done. Satisfied, the boss leaves, telling them they can work after supper or on Slim's grain team. After the boss leaves, George scolds Lenny for speaking. The old swamper returns with an old sheepdog. George asks Candy about his dog. Candy says he's ra he raised the dog from a pup and that he was a great sheepdog in his younger days. Curly, the boss's son, enters and sizes up George. Curly's not a nice guy, as you can have seen. Looking at Lenny, Curly fists his hands and assumes a fighter's stance. He, he was a little runt of a guy who has a little Caesar complex. He wants to know if they are the are the new guys, and when George answers, Curly insists that Lenny must talk when he is spoken to. Lenny repeats George's answer softly. Satisfied, Curly leaves to go look for his father. With Curly gone, Candy explains that Curly used to be a lightweight fighter, and now he hates big guys and picks fights with them. If that weren't bad enough, according to Candy, Curly has gotten much worse since his marriage two weeks earlier. I guess apparently he married a tart, as they call her. Candy uh, relates that Curly's wife is pretty, but she has got the eye, which is bad. <laughs> she flirts with Slim and Carlson, and Candy leaves, and George tells Lenny to stay away from Curly and not speak to him. However, George says if Curly punches Lenny, Lenny is to let him have it. Then George reminds Lenny of the place by the river where he is to get go in case of trouble. Shortly after Curly's wife comes into the Bunkhouse claiming to look for Curly. Fascinated, Lenny can't take his eyes off her. Then Slim enters and tells her he saw Curly go into the house. Curly's wife becomes apprehensive and leaves. When George says that Curly's wife seems like a tramp, Lenny responds that he thinks she is pretty, causing George to warn Lenny to keep away from her, just like he's supposed to keep away from Curly. This admonition worries Lenny, who says, I don't like this place, George. This ain't a good place. But George reminds him they must stay long enough to make a, take a stake for their farm. Make a stake for their farm, they need to make money. Another man, Carlson, enters the bunkhouse and asks Slim about his new puppy, suggesting that they could replace Candy's old dog, who is old, arthritic, and can barely walk. Let's see with one of the pup. Let's see with one of the puppies. Hearing about the puppies, Lenny wants one, too, and asks George to speak to Slim. Supper is called as Lenny gets off the bunk and approaches the door. Curly returns looking for his wife. George tells him that she was there looking for Curly. George is afraid he will tangle with Curly himself as they all leave for supper. Analysis. Chapter 1 begins with a beautiful nature scene, the gentle breeze, the slopes of the mountains, the evening sun going down in the calm pool. Chapter 2 introduces the ranch. The bunkhouse is sparsely furnished. It's a dark room with just the essentials of a bunk and a place to put gear. Once the story shifts from the natural setting of Chapter 1 to the bunkhouse, in Chapter 2, things change considerably. Steinbeck contrasts the world of nature and the world of men. At the pond, the water is warm, the breeze gentle, <coughs> and the light shimmers over the sand. No wonder George wants to spend the night there instead of coming straight to the ranch. In contrast, the ranch contains 
characters who have been beaten down by life. It also contains danger in the form of Curly and his wife. By juxtaposing the natural scene at the pond with the, the scene in the bunkhouse, Steinbeck highlights the contrast between the freedom of nature and the unpredictable pattern of humans in their sometimes dangerous ways. Okay. The atmosphere of the bunkhouse can be determined by the people George and Lenny meet there. Through the appearance of various characters, George and Lenny get a feeling for the lay of the land. These characters represent various parts of American society during the Depression, and they also speak of some of the sadness of that time. Loneliness, rootlessness, and poverty, Candy and Crooks in particular, are characters separated from the others. Candy by old age and his handicap of only one hand, and Crooks because of his race. Yet when Candy reveals that the last guy, the one who had George's bunk, left because it was time to move on, we see the loneliness that plagues all the men who like, plague all, plagues all the men who, like George and Lenny, move from place to place to find work. In this way, Steinbeck describes the general situation of the migrant hands. They work somewhere for a short time and move on to some other equally lonely place. On three different occasions, characters express suspicion of Lenny and George traveling together. First, the boss questions whether or not George is using Lenny for his pay. The second person to question them is Curly's, the boss's son, rather than question their economic relationship. Curly hints that they have a sexual relationship. When he questions George and George says, we traveled together, Curly responds, oh, so it's that way. The third question comes from Slim, the prince of the ranch, whose comment is in the form of a friendly statement rather than a question. You guys travel around together? When George answers that they look after each other, Slim says, ain't many guys travel around together. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. This repetition of the same question serves two purposes. First, the fact that two men traveling together is unusual reinforces that the life of a migrant hand in the 1930s agricultural world is one of loneliness and rootlessness. Second, it provides insight into the, in each, char each of the characters asking the questions. Question. The boss, by his presumption that George is taking Lenny's pay, shows him to be a man of business, interested solely in the bottom line. Curly, by his insinuation that the relationship is a sexual one, shows him to be a base and cruel person. Slim's reaction shows him to be the only one with the compassion to understand how traveling together might help the loneliness. Throughout this chapter, Steinbeck pairs up various characters and situations. For example, the setting of the second chapter contrasts with the scene described at the beginning of chapter 1. Instead of a calm and peace, chapter 2 has an air of menace, largely caused by the presence of two characters on the ranch, Curly and his wife. While George can see the problems that they may rise, Lenny can feel the menacing atmosphere. After sizing up Lenny as a big guy but lacking intelligence, Curly makes it a point to single out Lenny as someone who should speak when spoken to. Lenny immediately feels the menace, and the re reader sees Curly right away as a bully. The real problem, however, is Curly's wife. In addition to causing problems between the ranch hands and her husband, who has mandated that she is not speak to anyone. She is fascinating to Lenny, who sees only her prettiness and softness, not the danger she represents. George clearly sees the danger, however, and this immediate reaction to her is anger. He alternately calls her a tramp, bitch, jailbait, poison, and a rat trap. His anger scares Lenny, who was fascinated with this creature he has never seen before. The character at, characters at this ranch also are paired sometimes for the similarities they share. George and Candy and Crooks and Candy, sometimes for the difference. Slim and Carlson, for example, is the sensitive, compassion, ma passionate man whose word is law. Everyone respects him, and he seems to be the only one who is capable of understanding why. George and Lenny travel together. Carlson, however, lovingly cleans his gun and is animalistic at and sensitive. He is the one who thinks Candy's dog should be shot. That's awful. Candy and Crooks represent another pair because both are alienated from the others because of artificial barriers placed on them by society. One being because he's old and crippled, the other because of the color of his skin. That's uh, what I uh, 
that's the society will do. They'll uh, separate you once you. They, they've had it. They don't need you if you're old. You know you've already fulfilled your uh, your need for you know fulfilled whatever it is you're supposed to fulfill in society. And of course, uh, in this particular society, anybody who's different from in this case happened to be someone who was who was uh, colored black, as it, or as they called them back then, or amongst other things. So. That's a faster society for you. Okay, where am I? Okay. I'm trying to find where where I was. Oh. Okay, both characters will later connect with George and Lenny's dream as a way out of their loneliness and alienation. Finally, George and Candy are paired. Both men are responsible and care for their, those unable to care for themselves. George is a caretaker for Lenny. Candy is a caretaker for, of his old dog. Well, Carlson wants Slim to give Candy a pup to replace his old dog. George wants Slim to give Lenny a pup to take care of a pet and pet. This final pairing is also important because it foreshadows the novel's final scene between George and Lenny. Finally, in this chapter, Steinbeck has clearly delineated the lines of conflict. Whoops. I'm sorry. What's my place? I'm going to get back on down here. Finally, in this chapter, Steinbeck has clearly delineated the lines of conflict. The menace coming from the evil and bullying of Curly and the seductive temptation of his wife. These two are catalysts of fear each time they appear. Even Lenny, who feels things instinctively as an animal does, says, I don't like this place, George. This ain't no good place. I want to get out of here. In the second scene, the reader has only to wait for their eventual tragedy. So we are going to get back into chapter three. Chapter three. Although there was evening brightness showing through the windows of the bunkhouse, inside it was dark. It was dusk. To the open door came the thuds and occasional plangs of a horseshoe game, and now and then the sound of voices raised in approval or derision. Slim and George came into the darkening bunkhouse together. Slim reached up over the card table and turned on the tin-shaded electric light. Instantly, the table was brilliant with light, and the cone of the shadow of the shade threw its brightness straight downward, leaving the corners of the bunkhouse till in dusk. Slim sat down in a box, and George took his place opposite. It wasn't nothing, said Slim. I would have had to drown most of them anyways. No need to thank me about that, George said. It wasn't much to you, maybe, but it was a hell of a lot to him. Jesus Christ, I don't know how we are going to get him to sleep in here. He'll want to sleep right out in the barn with him. We'll have trouble keeping him from getting right in the box with him, Pops. It wasn't nothing, Slim repeated. Say, you sure was right about him. Maybe he ain't bright, but i never seen such a worker. He damn near killed his partner, Buck and Barley. There ain't nobody can keep up with him. God Almighty, I never seen such a strong guy. Let me get my drink here. <laughs> there we go. George spoke proudly. Just tell Lenny what to do, and he'll do it if he don't take no figuring. He can't think of nothing to do himself, but he sure can take orders. There was a clang of horseshoe on iron stake outside and a little share of voices. Slim moved back slightly so the light was not on his face. Funny how you and him string all along together. It was Slim's calm invitation to confidence. What's funny about it, George demanded defensively. Oh, I don't know. Hardly none of the guys we have ever traveled together. I hardly ever seen two guys travel together. You know how the hands are. They just come in and get their buck, bunk and work a month, and then they quit and go out alone. Never seemed to give a damn about nobody. It just seems kind of funny, a cuckoo like him and a smart little guy like you traveling together. He ain't no cuckoo, said George. <coughs> He's dumb as hell, but he ain't crazy. And I ain't so bright, neither, or I wouldn't be bucking barley for my fifty and bound. If I was bright, if I was even a little bit smart, I'd have my own little place, and I'd be bringing in my own crops, instead of doing all the work and not getting what comes up out of the ground. George fell silent. He wanted to talk. Slim neither encouraged nor discouraged him. He just sat back, quiet and receptive. It ain't so funny, 
him and me going round together, George said at last. Him and me was both born in Auburn. I knowed him, his Aunt Clara. She took him when he was a baby and raised him up. When his Aunt Clara died, Lenny just come along with me out working. Got kind of used to each other after a little while. Um, said Slim. George looked over Slim and saw the calm, godlike eyes fastened on him. Funny, said George. I used to have a hell of a lot of fun with him. He used to play jokes on him because he was too dumb to take care of himself, but he was too dumb even to know he had a joke played on him. I had fun. Maybe made me seem goddamn smart alongside of him. Why, he'd do any damn thing I told him. If I told him to walk over a cliff, he'd, over he'd go. That wasn't so damn much fun after a while. He never got mad about it, neither. I beat the hell out of him, and he couldn't bust every bone in my... And he, he could have bust every bone in my body just with his hands, but he never lifted a finger against me. George's voice was taking on the vo tone of a confession. Tell you what made me stop that. One day a bunch of guys was standing around up on the Sacramento River. I was feeling pretty smart. I turns to Lenny and says, jump in. And he jumps. Couldn't swim a stroke. He damn near drowned before we could get him. And he was so damn nice to me for pulling him out. Clean forgot I told him to jump in. Well, I ain't done nothing like that no more. He's a nice fellow, says Slim. Guys don't need no sense to be a nice fella. Seems to me sometimes it just works the other way around. Take a real smart guy and he ain't hardly ever a nice fella. George stacked the scattered cards and began to lay out his solitaire hand. The shoes thudded on the ground outside. At the windows, the light of the evening still made the window squares bright. I ain't got no peoples, George said. I seen the guys that go around on the ranches alone. That ain't no good. They don't have no fun. After a long time, they get mean. They get wanting to fight all the time. Yeah, they get mean, Slim agreed. They get so, so they don't want to talk to nobody. Of course, Lenny's a goddamn nuisance most of the time, and said George. But you get used to going around with a guy, and you can't get rid of him. You ain't mean, said Slim. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can see Lenny ain't a bit mean. Of course, he ain't mean, <coughs> but he gets in trouble all the time because he's so goddamn dumb. Like what happened in weed, he stopped, stopped in the middle of turning over a card. He looked almost, he looked alarmed and peered over at Slim. You, you wouldn't tell nobody. What are you doing weed, Slim asked calmly. You wouldn't tell, no, of course you wouldn't. What are you doing weed, Slim asked again. Well, he's seen this girl in a red dress, a dumb bastard like he is. He wants to touch everything he likes, just wants to feel it. So he reaches out to feel this red dress, and the girl lets out a squeak. And that gets Lenny all mixed up. And he holds on because that's the only thing he can think to do. Well, this girl squawks and squawks. I was just a little bit off, and I heard all the yelling. So I comes running. And by that time, Lenny's so scared, all he can think to do is just hold on. I socked him over the head with a fence picket to make him let go. He was so scared, he couldn't let go of that dress. And he's so goddamn strong, you know. Some's eyes were level and unwinking. He nodded very slowly. So it happens. George carefully built his line of solitaire cards. Well, that girl rabbits in and tells the law she has been she been raped. The guy is in weed, started a per party out to lynch Lenny. So we sit in an irrigation ditch under water all the rest of that day. Got on your own, got on your own head, our heads sticking out from the side of the ditch. And that night we scrammed out of there. Slim sat in silence for a moment. Didn't hurt the girl none, huh? He asked finally. Hell no, he just scared her. I'd be scared, too, if he grabbed me, but he never hurt her. He just wanted to touch the red dress like he wants to get them pups all the time. Just like he wants to pet them pups all the time. He ain't mean to Slim. I can tell a mean guy a mile off. Of course he ain't. He'll do any damn thing I... Then he came in through the door. He wore his blue denim coat over his shoulders like a cape. And he walked hunched way over. Hi, Lenny, said George. How do you like the pup now? Lenny said breathlessly. He's brown and white just like I wanted. He went directly to his bunk and lay down and turned his face to the wall and drew up his knees. George put down his cards very deliberately. Lenny, he said sharply. Lenny twisted his neck and looked over his shoulder. Huh? What you want, George? I told you you couldn't bring that pup in here. What pup, George? I ain't got no pup. George went quickly to him, grabbed him by the shoulder and rolled him. Reached down and picked the tiny pup from where Lenny had been concealing against his stomach. Lenny sat up quickly. Give him to me, George. George said, you get right up and take this pup right back to the nest. 
He's got to sleep with his mother. You want to kill him? Just born last night and you take him out of the nest? You take him back or I'll tell Slim not to let you have him. Lenny held out his hands pleadingly. Give him to me, George. I'll take him back. I didn't mean no harm. George, <coughs> George honest. I didn't. I just wanted to pet him a little. George handed the pup to him. All right, you get him back there, quick. Don't you take him out no more. You'll kill him, first thing you know. Lenny fairly scuttled out of the room. <coughs> Excuse me. Slim had not moved. His calm eyes followed Lenny out the door. Je Jesus, he said, he's just like a kid, ain't he? Sure, he's just like a kid. There ain't no more harm in him than a kid, neither, except he's so strong. I bet he won't come in here to sleep tonight. He's He'd sleep right alongside that box in the barn. Well, let him. He ain't doing no harm out there. It was almost dark outside now. Old Candy, the swamper, came in and went to his bunk. Beside him struggled his old dog. Hello, Slim. Hello, George. Didn't either of you play horseshoes? I don't like to play him. Play every night, said George. Excuse me, every night, said Slim. Candy went on. Neither you guys. Either you guys got a slug of whiskey. I got, I got a gut ache. <coughs> I ain't, said Slim. I'd drink it myself if I had, and I ain't got a gut ache neither. Got a bad gut ache, said Candy. Them goddamn turnips, give it to me. I'd knowed they was going to before I ever eat them. The, thir the thick bodied Carlson came in out of the darkening yard. He walked to the other so end of the bunkhouse and turned on the second shaded light. Darker than hell in here, he said. Jesus, how that negro can pitch shoes. He's plenty good, said Slim. Damn right he is, said Carlson. He don't give nobody else a chance to win. He stopped and sniffed the air and sniffed the air and still sniffing. Looked down at the old dog. God almighty, that dog stinks. Get him out of here, Candy. I don't know anything that stinks as bad as an old dog. You gotta get him out. Candy rolled to the edge of the bu his bunk. He run... <laughs> he reached over and patted the ancient dog and he apologized. I've been around him so much I never notice how he stinks. Well, I can't stand him in here, said Carlson. That stink hangs around even after he's gone. He walked over with his heavy legged stride and looked down at the dog. Got no teeth, he said. He's all stiff with rheumatism. He ain't no good to you, Candy, and he ain't no good to himself. Why don't you shoot him, Candy? Well, he is good. The old man squirmed uncomfortably. Well, hell, I had him so long, had him since he was a pup. I herded sheep with him, he said proudly. You would th wouldn't think it to look at him now, but he was the best damn sheep dog I ever seen, George said. I seen a guy in weed that had an Airedale could herd sheep. Learned it from the other dogs. Carlson was not to be put off. Look, Candy, this old dog just suffers himself all the time. If you was to take him out and shoot him right in the back of the head. Ooh. He leaned over and pointed right there why he'd never know what hit him. Candy looked about unhappily. No, he said softly. No, I couldn't do that. I had him too long. You don't have no fun, Carlson says, and he stinks that beat hell. Tell you what, I'll shoot him for you. Then it won't be you that does it. Candy threw his legs off his bunk. He scratched the white stubble whiskers on his cheek nervously. So used to him, he said softly. Had him from a pup. Well, you ain't being kind to him, keeping him alive, said Carlson. Look. Slim bitch got a litter right now. Slim's bitch got a litter right now. <clears throat> I bet Slim would give you one of them pups to raise up, wouldn't you, Slim? The skimmer. Skinner had been studying the old dog with his commage. Yeah, he said, you can have a pup if you want to. He seemed to shake himself free for speech. Carl's right, Candy. The, that dog ain't no good to himself. I wish somebody would shoot me if I got old and, and a cripple. Candy looked helplessly at him. For Slim's opinions were law, and maybe it hurt him, he suggested. I don't mind taking care of him. <laughs> Get rid of the uh, old and the infirm, and anybody that's not like you. Carlson said, the way I'd shoot him, he wouldn't feel nothing. I'd put the gun right there, he pointed with his toe. Right back of his, the head, he wouldn't even quiver. Candy looked for help from face to face. It was quite dark outside by now. A young laboring man came in. His sloping shoulders were bent forward and he walked heavily on his heels as though he carried the invisible grain bag. He went to his bunk and put his hat on the sh his shelf. Then he picked a pulp magazine from his shelf and brought it to the light over the table. Did I show you this, Slim? he asked. Show me what. 
The young man turned to the back of the magazine, put it down on the table, and pointed with his finger. Right there, read that. Read that, Slim bent over. Go on, said the young man. Read it out loud. Dear editor, Slim read slowly. I read your mag for six years, and I think it's the best on the market. I like stories by Peter Rand. I think he is a wing ding. Give us more like the Dark Rider. I don't write many letters, just thought I would tell you. I think your mag is the best dime's worth I ever spent. <clears throat> Slim looked up questioningly. What you want me to read that for? Wit said. Go on, read the name at the bottom, Slim read. Yours for success, William Tenner. He glanced up at Wit again. What you want me to read that for? Wit closed the magazine impressively. Don't you remember Bill Tenner? Worked here about three months ago. Slim thought, little guy, he asked, drove a cultivator. That's him, Whip cried. That's the guy. You think he's the guy who wrote this letter? I know it. Bill and me was in here one day. Bill had one of them books that just come. He was looking at it. He says, I wrote a letter. Wonder if they put it in the book. But it wasn't there, Bill says. Maybe they're saving it for later. And that's just what they done. There it is. Yes, you're right, Slim. Got it right in the book. George held out his hand for the magazine. Let's look at it. Whip found the place again, but he did not surrender his hold on it. He pointed out the letter with his forefinger, and then he went to his box shelf and laid the magazine carefully in it. I wonder if Bill's seen it, he said. Bill and me worked in that patch of peat field peas. Run cultivators, both of us. Bill was a hell of a nice guy, fellow. During the conversation, Carlson had refused to be drawn in. He continued to look down at the old dog. Candy watched him uneasily. At last, Carlson said, if you want me to, I'll put the devil out of his misery right now and get it over with. Ain't nothing left for him. Can't eat, can't see, can't even walk without hurting. Candy said, hopefully, you ain't got no gun. Hell, I ain't got a luger. It won't hurt him none at all. Candy said, maybe tomorrow. Let's wait till tomorrow. I don't see no reason for it, said Carlson. He went to his bunk, pulled his bag from underneath and took out a luger pistol. Let's get it over with, he said. We can't sleep with him stinking around in here. He put the pistol in his hip pocket. Candy looked a long time at Slim to try to find some reversal. I just told him to shut the F up. And I'm being nice there. I love my cats, no matter how old they were. And Slim gave him none. At last, Candy said softly and hopelessly, All right, take him. He did not look down at the dog at all. He lay back on his bunk and crossed his arms behind his head and stared at the ceiling. From his pocket, Carlson took a leather thong. He stooped over and tied it around the old dog's neck. All the men except Candy watched him. Come, boy, come on, boy, he said gently, and he said apologetically to Candy. You won't even feel it. Candy did not move up, nor answer him. He twitched the thong. Come on, boy, the old dog got slowly and slowly to his, stiffly to his feet and followed the gentle pulling leash. Slim, said Carlson. Yeah, you know what to do. What do you mean, Slim? Take a shovel, said Slim shortly. Oh, sure, I got gotcha. you. I get you. He led the dog out into the darkness. <clears throat> George followed the, to the door and shut the door and set the latch gently in its place. Candy lay rigidly on his bed, staring at the ceiling. Slim said loudly, One of my old, my lead mules got a bad hoof. Got to get some tire on it. His voice trailed off. It was silent outside. Carlson's footsteps died away. The silence came into the room, and the silence lasted. George chuckled, I bet Lenny's right out there in the barn with his pup. He don't want to come in here no more. Now he's got a pup. Some said, Candy, you have any one, any one of them pups you want? Candy did not answer. The silence fell on the room again. Came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, Anybody like to play a little euchre? I'll play out a few with you, said Wit. They took places up opposite each other at the table under the light, but George did not shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the ner deck nervously in the little... Snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room so that, that he stopped doing it. Silence fell on the room again. A minute passed, and another minute. Candy lay still, staring at the ceiling. Slim gazed at him for a moment, and then looked down at his hands. He subdued one hand with the other and held it down. There came a little gnawing sound from the under the, <coughs> under the door, and all the men looked down toward it gratefully. Only can Candy continued to stare at the ceiling. Sounds like there was a rat under there, said George. We ought to get a trap down there. Whip broke out. What the hell's taking him so long? Lay out some cards, why don't you? We ain't go going to get no euchre play this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. 
The man looked quickly at the old man, every head turned toward him. For a moment he continued to stare at the ceiling, then he rolled over and faced the wall and lay silent. George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Wit drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. Wit said, I guess you guys really come here to work. How do you mean, George asked. Wit laughed. Well, you come on a Friday, you got two days to work till Sunday. I don't see how you figure, said George. Wit laughed again. You do if you've been around these big ranches much. Guy that wants to look over a ranch comes in Saturday, Saturday afternoon. He gets Saturday night supper and three meals on Sunday, and he can quit Monday morning after breakfast without turning his hand. But you come to work Friday night noon. You got to put in a day and a half no matter how you figure. George looked at him levelly. We are going to stick around a while, he said. Me and Lenny's going to roll up a stake. The door opened quietly in the stable, but put in his head, a, a lean negro head lined with pain. The eyes patient. Mr. Slim? Slim took his eyes from old Candy, huh? Oh, hello, Crooks. What's the matter? You told me to warm up tar for that mule's foot. I got it warm. Oh, sure, Crooks. I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No, I'll come do it myself, he stood up. Crook said, Mr. Slim? Yeah. That big new guy's messing around your pups out in the barn. Well, he ain't doing no harm. I give him one of the, one of them pups. Just thought I'd tell you, Sir Crooks. He's taking them out of the nest and handling them. That won't do them no good. He won't hurt them, said Slim. I'll come al along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's fooling around too much, just kick him out, Slim. Slim let fall the stable, bucked out of the room. George dealt, and Wit picked up his cards and examined them. Seen the new kid yet, he asked. What kid, George asked. Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah, I seen her. Well, ain't she a Lulu? I ain't seen that much of her, said George. Wit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealing nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye going all the time on everybody. Bet she even... Gives the stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants, George asked casually. Been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Whit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped in. Scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate solitaire hand, seven cards and six on top, and five on top of those. Whit said, I see what you mean. No, they ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but that's all so far. Every time the guy is around, she shows up. She's looking for Curly, or she looks, or she thought she left something laying around, and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And Curly's pants are just crawling with ants, but they ain't nothing come out of it yet. George said, she's going to make a mess. There's going to be a bad mess about her. She's a jail bait all set on the trigger. That curly got his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it ain't no place for a girl, especially like her. Wit said, if you got ideas, you ought to come in town with us guys tomorrow night. Why? What's do doing? Just the usual thing. We go into old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh. Always cracking jokes. Like she says when we come up in the front porch last Saturday night. Susie opens the door and then she yells over her shoulder. Get your coats on, girls. Here comes the sheriff. She never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it set you back, uh, George asked. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie got nice chairs to set in, too. If a guy doesn't don't want to flop, why, he can <laughs> just sit in the chairs and have a couple of three shots. Pass the time of day, and Susie got, don't give a damn. She ain't rushing guys through and kicking them out if they don't want a flop. Might go on a look, up, look the joint over, said George. Sure. Come along. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Her cracking jokes all the time. Like she says, <clears throat> sometime. One time she says. Excuse me. I've knew people that if they got a rag rug on the floor and a cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they are running a parlor house. That's Clara's house she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want, she says. My girls is clean, she says. And there ain't no water in my whiskey, she says. If any of you guys want to look at a cupid doll lamp and take your own chance getting burned, why, you know where to go. And she says, 
<coughs> this guy's around here walking bow-legged because like they look <coughs> like to look at a Cupid doll lamp. I'll show what she means with that again. Different era. George asked. Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, said Whip. We don't never go there. Clara gets three bucks a crack and 35 cents a shot. And she don't crack no jokes. But Susie's place is clean and she got nice chairs. Don't let don't let no goo-goos in either. And neither, whatever that means. Me and Lenny's rolling up a steak, said George. I might go in and set and have a shot, but I ain't putting out no two and a half. Well, a guy got to have some fun sometimes at wit. <laughs> I think I got an idea what they're talking about. The door opened and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract tension. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at old Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the bag and a can of oil. He laid them on his bed and then brought out the pistol, took out the magazine, slapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with a little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. Carlson said casually, Curly been in yet? No, said Wit. What's eating on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun, looking for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside. Wit said sarcastically. He's <coughs> he spent half his time looking for her. The rest of the time she's looking for him. Carlson burst into the room. Excited Curly burst into the room excitedly. Any of you guys see my wife, he demanded. She ain't been here, said Whit. Curly looked threateningly about the room. Where's, where the hell's Slim? Went out in the barn, said George. He was going to put some tar on a split root. Huh. Curly's shoulders dropped and squared. How long ago did he go? Five, ten minutes. Curly jumped out the door and banged it after the, him. Whit stood up. I guess maybe I'd like to see this, he said. Curly's just spoiling where he wouldn't start for Slim. And Curly's handy, goddamn handy. Got in the finals for the Golden Gloves. He got newspaper clippings about it. He considered, but just the same, he better leave Slim alone. Nobody don't know what Slim can do. Thinks Slim's with his wife, don't he, said George. Looks like it, Wet said. Of course, Slim ain't. At least I don't think Slim is, but I'd like to see the fuss if it comes off. Come on, let's go, George said. I'm staying right here. I don't want to get mixed up in nothing. Lenny and me got to make a state. Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag into the bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over, he said. Old Candy lay still. <clears throat> and Lenny, from his bunk, watched George cautiously. When Wint and Carlson were gone and the door closed after them, George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? I ain't done nothing, George. <clears throat> Slim says I'd better not pet them pups so much for a while. Slim says it ain't good for them, so I come right in. I've been good, George. I could have told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hurting him none. I just had mine in my lap, pet net. George asked, did you see Slim out in the barn? Sure I did. He told me I better not pet that pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways, I've never, I never seen her. Never seen Slim talking to her? Uh-huh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay, said George. I guess them guys ain't going to see no fight. If there's any fight in Lenny, you keep out of it. I don't want no fight, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down on the table across from George. Almost automatically, George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand. He used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness. Lenny reached for a face card and studied it, then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is it both ends the same? I don't know, said George. That's just the way they make them. <clears throat> what was Slim doing in the barn when you seen him? Slim? Sure. You seen him in the barn, and he told you not to pet the pups so much. Oh, yeah, I had a can of tar and a paintbrush. I don't know what for. You sure that girl didn't come in like she come in here today? No, she never come. George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said. A guy can go in and get drunk and get everything out of his system all at once and no messes and he knows how much it's <clears throat> gonna set him back. These here jail baits is just set on the trigger of the Huska. <clears throat> Huskow, whatever that is. 
Lenny followed his words admiringly and moved his lips. Little to, <coughs> little to keep up. George continued. You remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to grammar school. The one that his old lady used to make hot cakes for the kids? Lenny asked. Yeah, that's the one. You can remember anything if there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitary end. He put an ace up on his scoring rack and piled a two, three, and a four of di diamonds on it. Andy's in San Quentin right now on account of a tart, said George. Lenny drummed on the table with his fingers. George? Huh, George. How long is it going to be till we get that little place and live on the fat of the land and rabbits? I don't know, said George. we got to get a big steak together. I know a little place. We can get cheap, but they ain't giving it away. Old Candy turned slowly over. His eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. Lenny said, Tell about that place, George. I just told you just last night. Go on. Tell again, George. Well, it's ten acres, said George. Got a little windmill. Got a little shack on it. A chicken run. Got a kitchen. Orchard, cherries, apples, peaches, cots, nuts. Got a few berries. There's a place for alfalfa and plenty of water to flood it. There's a pig pen and rabbits, George. No place for rabbits now, but I could easy <coughs> build a few hutch hutches and you could feed alfalfa to the rabbits. Damn right I could, said Lenny. You goddamn right I could. George's hands stopped working with the cards. His voice was growing warmer. And we could have a few pigs. I could build a smokehouse like the one Grandpa had. And when we kill a pig, we can smoke the bacon and the hams, make sausage and all that like that. And when the salmon run up, run up river, we could catch a hundred of them and salt them down and smoke them. We could have them for breakfast. They ain't nothing <clears throat> so nice as smoked salmon. When the fruit come in, we could can it and tomatoes, they, they're easy to can. Every Sunday we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. Maybe we'd have a cow or a goat and the cream is so goddamn thick you could got to cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon. Lenny watched him with wide eyes, and old Candy watched him, too. Lenny said softly, we could live off of the fat of the land. Sure, said George. All kinds of vegetables in the garden, and if we want a little whiskey, we can sell a few eggs or something or some milk. <clears throat> we just live there. We just live there. We would belong there. <clears throat> Excuse me. There wouldn't be no more running around the country and getting fed by a Japanese cook. I'm assuming that's what they mean. Just... No, sir, we'd have our own place where we'd belong and not sleep and not no bunkhouse. Tell about the house, George, Lenny begged. Sure, we'd have a little house and a room to ourselves. Little fat iron stove, and in the winter we'd keep a fire going in it. It ain't enough land, so we'd have to work too hard. Maybe six, seven hours a day. We wouldn't have to buck no barley 11 hours a day. And when we put in a crop, why, we'd be there to take the crop up. We'd know what come of our planting. And rabbits, Lenny said eagerly. And I'd take care of them. Tell how I'd do that, George. Sure, how you'd go out in the alfalfa patch and you'd have a sack. I know it. You'd fill up the sack and bring it in and it in, put in the rabbit cages. They nibble and they nibble, said Lenny, the way they do. I seen them. Ever six weeks or so, George continued. Them does would throw away litter so we'd have plenty we'd have plenty of rabbits to eat and to sell, and we'd keep a few pigeons to go flying around the windmill like they done when I was a kid. He looked raptly at the wall over Lenny's head, and it'd be our own, and nobody could can us. If we don't like a guy, we can say, get the hell out, and by God, he'd got to do it. And if it's a friend come along, why, we'd have an extra bunk, and we'd say, why don't you spend the night? And by God, he would. We'd have a setter dog and a couple striped cats. But you got to watch out them cats. Don't get the little rabbits. Lenny breathed hard. You just let them try to get the rabbits. I'll break their goddamn nuts. Not very nice. I'll, I'll smash them with a stick. He subdued, grumbling to himself, threatening the future cats, which might dare to disturb the future rabbits. 
Asteroid 7 trench with his own pitcher. When Candy spoke, they both jumped as though they had been caught doing something reprehensible. Candy said, you know where is a place like that? George was on guard immediately. Suppose I do, he said. What's that to you? You don't need to tell me where it's at. It might be any place. Sure, said George. That's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. Candy went on excitedly. How much they want for a place like that? George watched him suspiciously. Well, I could get it for 600 bucks. The old people that owns it is a flat bust, and the old lady needs an operation. Say, what's it to you? you got nothing to do with us. Candy said, I ain't much good with only one hand. I lost my hand right here on this ranch. That's why they give me a job swamping, and they give me $250 because I lost my hand, and I got 50 more saved up right in the bank right now. That's 300 and I got 50 more coming the end of the month. Tell you what, he, he leaned forward eagerly. Suppose I went in with you guys. That's 350 bucks I'd put in. I ain't much good, but I could cook and tend the chickens and hoe the garden some. How'd that be? Not a bad idea. George half closed his eyes. I gotta think about that. We was always gonna do it by ourselves. Candy interrupted him. I'd make a will and leave my share to you guys in case I kick off. Because I ain't got no relatives for nothing. You guys got any money? Maybe we could do her right now. George spat on the floor disgustedly. We got ten bucks between us. Then he said thoughtfully, look. If me and Lenny work a month or so and don't spend nothing, we'll have a hundred bucks. That'd be four fifty. I bet we could swing her for that. Then you and Lenny could go get her started and I'd get a job and make up the rest and you could sell eggs and stuff like that. They fell into a silence. They looked at one another, amazed. This thing they had never really believed in was coming true, George said reverently. Jesus Christ. I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. Candy sat on the edge of the, his bunk. He scratched the stump of his wrist nervously. I got hurt four years ago, he said. They'll can me pretty soon. Psst. Typical. Not much changes, huh? Nothing new under the sun. Just as soon as I can swamp out no bunkhouse, they'll put me on the county. Maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden even after I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and little chicken stuff like that. But I'll be on <clears throat> our own place and I'll, let, I'll be let to work in our own place. He said miserably, you seen what they done to my dog tonight? They said, says he wasn't no good to himself nor nobody else. When they canned me here, I wish somebody would shoot me, but they won't do nothing like that. I won't have no place to go, and I can't get no more jobs. I'll have $30 more coming time. You guys is ready to quit. George stood up. We'll do it, he said. We'll fix up that little old place. <clears throat> and we'll go live there. He sat down again. They all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of that other thing. Each mind was popped into the future. And this lovely thing should come about, George said wonderingly. Suppose there was a carnival or a circus come to town, or a ball game, or any damn thing. Old Con Candy nodded in appreciation of the idea. we just go to her, George said. We wouldn't ask nobody if we could, could just say, we'll go to her. And we would just, just milk the cow and sling some grain to the chickens and go to her. And put some grass to the rabbits. And Lenny broke in. I would not never forget to feed them when we got to do it, George. In one month. Right squ squawk in one month. Know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write to them old people that owns the place that will take take it. And Candy will send a hundred dollars to Binder. Sure will, said Candy. They got a good stove there? Sure, I got a nice stove. Burns coal or wood. I'm going to take my pup, said Lenny. I bet my, my Christ he likes it there by Jesus. Voices were approaching from outside. <laughs> George said quickly, don't tell nobody about it, just us three and nobody else. They libeled the can us so we can't make no state. Just go on like we was gonna buck barley the rest of our lives. Then all of a sudden, someday we'll go get our pay and scram out of here. Lenny and Candy nodded and they was grinning with delight. Don't tell nobody, Lenny said to himself. Candy said, George, huh? I ought to have shot that dog myself, George. I shouldn't 
ought to have let no stranger shoot my dog. The door opened. Slim came in, followed by Curly and Carlson a wet. Slim's hands were black with tar and he was scowling. Curly hung close to his elbow. Curly said, well, I ain't, didn't mean nothing, Slim. I just, as you. Slim said, well, you've been asking me too often. I'm getting goddamn sick of it. If you can't look after your own goddamn wife, what you expect me to do about it? You lay off of me. I'm just trying to tell you I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. just thought you might have saw her. Why don't you tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlson. You let her hang around bunkhouses and pretty soon you're going to have some, something on your hand and you won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlson. You keep out of this unless you want to step outside. Carlson laughed. You goddamn punk. He said, you tried to throw a scare into Slim and you couldn't make it stick. Slim threw a scare into you. You're yellow as a frog belly. I don't care if you're the best welter in the country. You come for me and I'll kick your goddamn head off. Candy joined the attack with joy. Love full of Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared, Curly glared at him. His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny. And Lenny was still smiling with delight at the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. What the hell are you laughing at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh? And Curly's rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard. Get up on your feet. No big son of a bitch. Don't laugh at me. I'll show you. You're what? Jello. Lenny looked helplessly at George. He got up and tried to retreat. Curly was balanced and poised. He slashed at Lenny with the left and then smashed down his nose with the, with the right. Lenny gave a cry of terror. Blood welled from his nose. George, he cried. Make him let me alone, George. He backed and pulled against the wall and Curly followed, slugging him in the face. Lenny's hands remained at his sides. He was too frightened to defend himself. George was on his feet yelling, Get him, Lenny. Don't let him do it. Lenny covered his face with his huge paws and bleated with terror. He cried, Make him stop, George. And then Curly attacked his stomach and cut off his wind. Some jumped up. The dirty little rat, he cried. I'll get him myself. George put out his hand and grabbed Slim. Wait a minute, he shouted. He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Get him, Lenny. Lenny shook, took his hands away from his face and looked about for George and Curly slashed at his eyes. The big face was covered with blood. George yelled again, I said get him. Curly's fist was swinging when Lenny reached for it. The next minute, Curly was flopping like a fish on a line. And his closed fist was lost in Lenny's big hand. George ran down the room. Let go of him, Lenny. Let go. But Lenny watched in terror the flopping little man whom he held. Blood ran down Lenny's face. One of his eyes was cut and closed. George slapped him in the face again. And again, still Lenny held on to the closed fist. Curly was white and shrunken by now, and his struggling had become weak. He stood crying, his fist lost in Lenny's paw. George shouted over and over, Let go his hand, Lenny. Let go. Slim, come help me while <clears throat> the guy got on his hand left. Suddenly, Lenny go let go his hand. He crouched, cowering against the wall. You told me to, George, he said, George, he said miserably. Curly sat down on the floor, looking in wonder at his crushed hand. Well, that's karma there. Slim and Carlson bent over him. Then Slim straightened up and regarded uh, Lenny with horror. We got to get him in, him to a, into a doctor, he said. Looks to me like he, like every bone in his hand is bust. I don't want to, Lenny cried. I don't want to hurt him, Slim said. Carlson, you get the candy wagon hitched up. We'll take him into Soledad and get him fixed up. Carlson hurried out. Slim turned to the whimpering Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. This punk sure had it coming to him. But Jesus, he ain't hardly got no hand left. Slim hurried out in a moment, returned with a tin cup of water. He held it to Curly's lips. George said, Slim, will we get canned now? We need the steak. Will Curly's old man can us now? Slim smiled wryly, knelt down beside Curly. You got your senses in your in hand enough to listen, he asked. Curly nodded. Well, then listen. Slim went on. I think you got your hand caught in a machine. If you don't tell nobody what happened, we ain't going to. But you just tell and try to get this guy can, and we'll tell everybody. And then will you get the laugh? I won't tell, said Curly, he avoided looking at Lenny. Buggy wheels sounded outside. Sim helped Curly up. Come on now. Carlson's going to take you to a doctor. He helped Curly out the door. The sound of wheels drew away. In a moment, Slim came back into the bunkhouse. He looked at Lenny, still crouched fearfully against the wall. Let's see your hands, he asked. 
and he stuck out his hands. Christ Almighty, I hate to have you mad at me, Slim said. George broke in. Lenny was just scared, he exclaimed. He didn't know what to do. I told you, nobody ought never to fight him. No, I guess it was Candy, I told. Candy nodded solemnly. That's just what you done. He said, right this morning when Curly first lit into your friend, you says, he's better not fool Lenny if he knows what's good for him. That's just what you says to me. George turned to Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. You don't need to be scared no more. You done just what I told you. Maybe you better go in the washroom and clean up your face. You look like hell. Lenny smiled with his bruised mouth. I didn't want no trouble, he said. He walked toward the door, but just before he came to it, he turned back. George, what do you want? I can still tend the rabbits, George. Sure, you ain't done nothing wrong. I didn't mean no harm, George. Well, get the hell out and wash your face. That's the end of Chapter 4. Next video, we will... Summarize and analyze chapter 3, and then we'll read chapter 4. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, and you stay safe and healthy, and you have a great day. Thank you.